Hello, my friend, and welcome to the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. And today you are in for a treat. We have Perry Marshall in the house. Uh, if you do not know Perry Marshall, you will be glad that you listen to this episode. I've known Perry man, for at least at least nine years, probably ten, maybe eleven, somewhere around there. And, and we get in the story of um, how I first came to know him, speak with him, uh, ordered some of his products and training. Uh, really smart guy, has an engineering background, you know, which really means he should not have succeeded in marketing, <laughs> at least according to traditional wisdom. The reality is sales and marketing is very analytical. It's when people get it right, it's because they follow processes and systems. Uh, they don't just shoot from the hip on this, which is the number one sin of the seven deadly sins of selling. So his analytical background, his precision, his methodical approach is why he uh, is successful. He's got a history in Google AdWords. That's uh, kind of his claim to fame back in the day. Uh, but he has expanded that into other solutions, other technologies, and uh, he's just a down-to-earth guy, uh, very fact-driven. And, you know, as entrepreneurs, we need that. You know, we need these these left-brain kind of guys to help us with the right-brain stuff. But he's done a, a great job of bridging the gap from left to right. Uh, so you're in for a treat. So I won't steal any more of his thunder. Uh, but I do want to mention that uh, I've changed some of the uh, pricing on the Make Every Sale program. There's now a monthly option, uh, and I'll be announcing here soon the first ever uh, Sales Whisperer reunion. So if you've ever purchased anything, it could be a book, it could be um, a course, it could be consulting, it could be Infusionsoft or HubSpot. Um, it looks like we're going to do this on Friday, January 26, 2018. So it's so two and a half, three months, yeah, less than three months away, that's for sure. So yeah, Friday the 26th. So it's going to be an all-day event, um, $199 uh, for you and a guest. And it's going to be no pitch. It's going to um, have a few speakers that um, you'll be glad to hear from. Uh, it'll be good food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There'll be some entertainment. There'll be some good SoCal wines, probably some local brews, also some local spirits. So um, we will eat, drink, and be merry and, um, and get some good ideas on how to grow in 2018 and beyond. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I just confirmed the date and location yesterday. So we'll be making up a quick landing page. I'll make a video for that. So that'll be coming out for sure in the middle of November. You know, I'm traveling this week. I actually leave today after I record this. Uh, to head to Phoenix, uh, Scottsdale, actually, for the annual Infusionsoft Partner Conference. So uh, that's always a great event, catching up with other partners and hearing from uh, the leadership there on what's new uh, coming out from Infusionsoft and uh, doing a little sales training as well for a client. I did some yesterday for a local bike shop a friend of mine purchased. So, you know, whether you're in retail or selling B2B, you're an SMB, B2G, B2C, how many more acronyms can we use? Um, but, you know, in a nutshell, if you are a human being and you sell to human beings and you would like to get better at selling to human beings, if you would like your team to get better at selling to human beings, I'm your guy. So we can do this remotely. Uh, we can do it in person. You can come to me. I can come to you. Uh, have the make every sale course with on demand content uh, for my private consulting clients. The access to the make every sale course is included. So that's a nice little bonus for you. So um, either way, let me know, reach out and give me a call. You can hit my website, schedule a free 15 minute call. Um, then if we need to, we can do a, a deep dive that uh, is only $500 um, where we spend time diving into your business. I give you some options, some, some assistance, some guidance. So, uh, very affordable options, regardless of the size of your company, you know, give me a call. Let's talk. Let's see how I can help you. All right. So, like I said, check out make or check out saleswhisper.com. contact us and we shall chat and you shall grow your sales. Now, let's grow your sales with Perry. Perry Marshall, all the way from uh, Chicago, right? Indeed. Indeed. Chicago. 
All right. Welcome to the Sales Podcast, man. It's great to uh, finally catch up with you. Well, thanks. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to talk to you and your folks. And, um, you know, I think uh, when, I, when I went into sales about 20-some years ago, after being an engineer, I thought, well, I don't really think those guys are all that smart. This shouldn't be <laughs> Piece of cake, huh? <laughs> Nothing for an <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So two years of bologna sandwiches and ramen soup and uh, baked potatoes and salsa. That's another cheap food. Um, yeah, it teaches you. Yeah, it was a rude awakening. Sales, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, man, you, you probably don't remember this, but I first uh, – so I learned about you through uh, Dan Kennedy in that world. And uh, it was 2008, and I bought your uh, Selling with White Papers program. Oh, okay, I yes. A big binder, and mm -hmm. uh, I still remember you offered one free call, and uh, I was traveling. I was in Houston, actually, at Buddy's house, and uh, that was when our one-hour call. I told my buddy, like, hold the beers. I got to talk with Perry, man. He's like, who the hell is this guy? I'm like, this is the dude I bought this white paper course from, so y'all just – you just hold the beers, and I went and had my call with you. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, was I helpful? What did you we were. talk about? You were, man, and uh, I still have that binder on my uh, on my shelf. All my Dan Kennedy stuff. I got your binder, uh, your eighty twenty book. Uh, I actually I modeled a lot of stuff. Uh, I wrote a book, the definitive guide to Infusionsoft. I got the idea oh. of your definitive guide to Google AdWords. I created, and I still have it, an Infusionsoft cheat sheet. I modeled it exactly after your Google AdWords cheat sheet. You know, obviously it's 100% different in the content, but the look, yep. the color, every yep. it's a two pager now. But I mean, I I reverse engineered everything you were doing with for Google AdWords to sell Infusionsoft. So uh, hey, it's it's a good way to sell is reverse engineer something else somebody's already doing and. Um, you know, we don't sell that, that white paper course anymore because uh, th the course itself was a little dated right. and we didn't want to update it. But, man, all that stuff is completely valid. You know, yeah. it, it would have required a facelift, which I didn't have time for. But, you know, the, look, um, you know, solving problems instead of merely peddling products will never go out of style. I mean, you can take that to the bank, right? right. Just act, just solve the problem, okay? Right. Yeah, and, and that's why that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is that I, I consider you now a bilingual, right? <laughs> Engineer mm. and sales, or maybe mm. bilingual sales and marketing. So, mm -hmm. um, and because uh, I, I love I love playing devil's advocate, right? I love getting in the into the brains of my listeners and coming up with all the objections they're going to tell themselves why they can't succeed, and then shooting holes in those. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, so you coming from an engineering background, because I've seen it all along. You know, I, I went to I went to the Air Force Academy. So very technical, right? A lot of engineering and math and science and blah blah blah. Uh, so I have I have an engineering mind, but I've always been in sales since I got out of the Air Force ninety seven. Mm. I've been in sales, mm. uh, and so I've worked with a lot of engineers. I've heard a lot of people over the years, and I just kind of chuckle. I'm like, bring it on, you know, say. Oh, sales. Yeah. Y'all, you get to golf, you get to go to nice dinners. I mean, how hard is it really? You make all this money and we're the brains, right? And it's like, well, you are That's... the brains, but people don't just buy brains. Right? No, that they, I, I had all that delusion when I was in engineering school, we would all sit in the engineering library and talk about how stupid all the business majors were and <laughs> all that stuff. And yeah, you know, kind of drinking our own pink Kool-Aid. And I remember when, when I started at my engineering job, it, about two weeks into it, I had this, I remember I was walking through a hallway. I don't remember what I was going on, but I remember just kind of, it sort of came to me. You know, three-fourths of the problems around here don't have anything to do with, like, traditional engineering problem solving. They're all people problems. Like, nobody gets along with anybody else in this company <laughs> there's all these little factions and everything and yeah like salespeople i mean they got to make the transaction happen despite the fact that all of that is going on right all over the place right so i mean it's uh it's pretty interesting and yeah you know you if you can if you can get away with thinking that none of that those problems exist and god bless you but you know Man, if you're a sales guy, it's in your face. And right. so, <laughs> yeah, rude awakening. So, 
yeah, it, 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 it took a while for me to gain my bearings. It, it was a hard road. So for somebody that, that is struggling in sales or, you know, they, maybe they've launched their business, they run through their list of friends and family, and now all of a sudden they got to really buckle down and really grow a business. Uh, and they don't want to spend two years eating ramen noodles. Um, are, are there some shortcuts? Are there some things you've learned over the years? Maybe you would do differently if you had to start over again to, to ramp up the revenue? Well, yeah. And, and it would start with, you know, the 80, 20 definition of sales is that it is not a convincing people process. It is a disqualification process. And really that's, that's like a brain transplant from the very, from the word go is if, if you think that your job as a salesperson is to go give this beautiful little speech to all these people and just convince as many of them as possible. You've really fundamentally misunderstood uh, because the, the first question is, well, should I be even talking to you in the first place? Right. Um, and, and the faster you try to figure out that you're like, they should be able to tell that you're trying to figure out that they're not the right person. That's actually the right posture. So, now, when you're, when you're really new, this is really hard to pull off because you're psychologically and everything else, you're inherently desperate. Like, well, I, gee, you know, I actually, I just want to get some orders if for no other reason to see how this thing actually works, you know, let alone making some money. Like, I just, I just want something to turn. I want something to roll here. But, but you really have to have this attitude that which you project is, hey, you know, uh, I can't help everybody and I probably can't help you. And if you're not, we're, I'm just going to figure out as fast as I can um, how we can move on. Um, and, and so, um, and th- this, this goes in, into how you you market as well. So I give you an example from my website and then I can, I can go into some, some other examples. Um, I have this little quiz on my site called is, Facebook for me, uh, is fb for mecom Um, and it's designed to repel the people that really shouldn't be advertising on Facebook. And when it was new, it was really, really designed to repel people. Like we, we actually, we changed the point system eventually because Facebook got better and better. But, but when, when our Facebook book first came out, probably only 10 or 15% of people ever had a chance of making it work. Um, and, and we did not want, so like, if so, let's say somebody knows Perry, likes Perry, trusts Perry, believes everything he says. The worst thing I could possibly do would be have them buy my Facebook book, spend two or three or $5,000 on Facebook ads spend two months of their life and go, this don't work. I put $10 in, I get $1 out. Like, uh, what the heck, man? Um, that would be the worst because then they won't trust me anymore. Then they, right? And I just wasted their money, right? And so we made this thing. It's like, we'll answer these 10 or 12 questions and we'll give you a score. And if you get like more than a seven out of 10 Yes, then you should do this, but it was def- definitely disqualifying everybody that got a zero through six is we're pushing them away. We're saying, don't do that. And whether you do that, and, and, and probably anybody listening to us today could probably conceive of some kind of a questionnaire that they could put in front of people before they ever even talk to them. You could maybe even put it on your website. You could hire a coder you know, maybe for a couple hundred bucks and put it up there and, you know, is fill in the blank for me or not? Can we help you? You know, you could be a tax attorney, you could be a missile manufacturer, you could be anything and you should be disqualifying people. Now, uh, my my friend, uh, John Paul Mendoza, um, he is a very interesting and colorful guy because He dropped out of high school, moved to Las Vegas, and became a professional gambler at age 17. And um, and and I got a story about that. I'll tell you a little bit later. But basically, 
he was in the gambling and organized crime world for three and a half years. And you realized, you know what? Well, he's sitting in a restaurant booth one day and these guys are having an argument. Uh, yes, you will. No, I won't. Yes, you will. No, I won't. And like out comes a Glock. Yes, you will. And John was watching this and he goes, you know, if I keep hanging around with these people, <laughs> I'm going to be dead. And so he, um, what he affectionately calls, he walked on. He just conveniently disappeared from that world without a trace. And he turned up later in Southern California selling, well, originally Mr. Coffee machines and then eventually real estate and defense contracts and like, okay, I'm going to walk the straight line. I'm going to be legal. I'm not going to do any of this crazy stuff anymore. And that was 30 years ago. But so, so here he is and he's, he's working uh, for some defense co company and a guy plops a list of leads on his desk and there's 206 names of people from all these different companies. And he says, John, I want you to go meet with every one of these 206 people. They all exist. We know they're there, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's an up-to-date list. I want you to go meet with these people and get, go get some business. Well, John had so much experience from all of his poker games and, you know, all his, his, all this other stuff, like basic street smarts. He's like, there is no way that anywhere near 206 of these people are worth my time. He knew the 80-20 principle. He knew that 80% of the business was going to come from no more than 20% of them and actually probably... You know, most of the business was going to come from 20% of the 20% or something like that. And so he said, you know, I don't want to drive all over Southern California, up and down Interstate 5, having a bunch of meaningless meetings with all these people. And so he came up with this thing called the five power disqualifiers. And they, this is really brilliant. This is actually pretty deep, okay? Okay. It is the five things that are always true every time anybody sells anything anywhere. Okay? That's a pretty good list. And here's what they are. Number one, they have the money. <laughs> every time a sale has been made in the history of Earth, it was sold to somebody who had money. They might have borrowed it from their grandmother. They might have got it from the U.S. government in their tax refund, but they had the money. Okay, and if they don't have the money, you stop all further attempts to sell them something. And like as obvious and simple as that may appear, I can tell you, I thought somehow or another that through kumbaya and magic fairy dust and unicorns and whatever, that if I liked the person and they liked my product, that somehow or another... Like this money was going to materialize. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking, but I mean, I could just think back to that first sales job. I'm talking to the, oh my goodness. So now, now it's yeah. interesting that, that the first rule is money. Yeah. Because I've, I've had this discussion and I do this in my training and, and it is still to this day. Uh, it is eye opening to my students and my clients because I tell them to have the money discussion up front. Yeah. And maybe not the exact price, but at a minimum, a, a ballpark that gets you close. And, you know, I, I want to know that early, right? If mm -hmm. I have a $20,000 coaching program, you know, I'm going to say something along the line. Hey, Perry, you know, hey, thanks for agreeing to meet. You know, again, before you even get too far along, I mean, what we're looking at, you know, can easily be be in the fifteen thousand dollar range. I have some customers fifty thousand dollars. I mean, but you know, it's not one or two. So I mean, does that, you know, does that ballpark? Does it does it frighten the pants off of you, or is this kind of where your head's at? You know, before you even go yeah. along. So something right. like that in the beginning. Right. So is that why it's number one for? Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, it is. It's also. It's the hardest. 
it's the hardest definer of whether or not a sale is going to be made. All of the other ones, the other four on the list are a little bit squishier, but that one is like super hard. And look, it's, it, there's just a basic psychology that we all have to realize about ourselves and about customers is everybody always wants to avoid the moment of truth. Okay. And I've seen this all kinds of ways, right? Like, so like, I know a guy who has, from what he tells me, a huge biomedical breakthrough. Um, I have told him five or six times that he needs to, and probably to prove this, he might even have to go to a foreign country that has different laws and test out a procedure. Okay. Um, I said, okay, like go to Thailand and find some doctor and tell him I can diagnose your patient better than your existing method. And like, I'll do it for free and I'll I just need a case study, whatever. But for whatever reason, this guy won't do it. As far as I can tell, I think he's just terrified that he's going to find out that something is broken, something doesn't work or whatever. And so, but what people do, they'll just go round and round. They'll just circle the problem. And I, I did this. Um, sometimes it takes real courage. But hey, man, f- fail fast. Right. Okay, fail fast. So, so disqualifier number two is do they have a bleeding neck? <laughs> okay. And, and, and w- w- here's a picture for that. You go, you go to the emergency room with a broken arm. Oh, I, you know, uh, I broke my arm. You go in there and like, you think it's the end of the world because your arm is dangling or something, right? You go in there, that lady gives you a clipboard and sits you down on a chair next to Good Housekeeping Magazine, and you fill out this clipboard, and you sit there for two hours while they play reality TV, and all these people wander in and out, and all this kind of stuff. Now, if some guy's got a gunshot wound, and blood is squirting out of his aorta onto the ceiling, they don't give him a clipboard. They send him, like, straight in, right? And so their definition of an emergency and your definition of emergency are like two completely different things. And the people that are going to give you money are the people that are in an emergency, okay? Their neck has to be bleeding. They have to be in pain. And if they're in pain, they're going to write the check. And so and so you have to make, like, do they have a bleeding neck? Is this problem an urgent problem? Now, the most like single most common thing that I've seen is people selling prevention instead of cure. And 8020 says that prevention is 16 times more difficult to sell than cure, even though it might be one one thousandth as expensive, right? It's like, yeah, I know exercise and eating right are way better than a heart attack, but you know, if you want heart attack money, find a guy who's having one, okay? And he'll come to the emergency room and he'll write a really big check and so will his insurance company. Now, you know, what's funny about these two things is both of these are just about simply noticing the way the world really operates and not being under any delusions, right? So there's the way that we want the world to be, and then there's the way the world is, like the should-be world versus the is world. Um, And, man, I look, I'm an idealistic person, and I like the should-be world as much as anybody, truly, okay? But it doesn't pay, (laughs) right? The should-be world doesn't pay nothing, right? So uh, power disqualifier number three is they buy into your unique selling proposition, which requires that you have a unique selling proposition. There's an astonishing number of people that don't actually have a unique selling proposition. They just have stuff that's fairly similar to the other guy's stuff, and they can't really answer the question like, why should I buy from you instead of anybody and everybody else who could sell me anything? And why should I buy it today instead of tomorrow? And why should I listen to you instead of somebody else? Um, uh, Okay, another one. The ability to say yes. 
most people that most people try to sell to can say no, but they can't say yes. Right. So like you're talking to the husband, but it's really the wife that makes the decision. You're talking to the wife, but it's really the husband that makes the decision. Well, if they don't have the ability to say yes, then forget it. Um, and, and so this also generally means selling top down. Um, so like before you, you know, you go meet with this low level engineer, um, like, well, do you have the ability to approve my, you know, if you go through this, can you actually approve this purchase or do you have to go to somebody else? It takes a lot of cojones to say, oh, well, since you don't have the authority, I really need to get approval from your boss's boss before I'm willing to go into all this with you guys. Now, I, I actually, I don't want to bounce this back to you. How do you handle it when there's this other person and it's not the guy you're talking to? How do you do that? Um, just like this, I say, this is my show and I ask the questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so you're saying, so the role play is I'm talking what one or two layers below the decision maker. Yeah. You're talking to an engineer and his boss's boss actually has to make the decision. Yeah. I mean, that's tough. I, I, I do the whole disqualification thing, right? I try to go up high. And even before I would set that meeting, I would say, you know, Hey Perry, this is a, one of the few times I'll make an assumption. Uh, I'm going to, because I'm going to assume that you have power and then I'm going to uh, bestow that power upon you. Right. So, Let's say I, I know that I'm three levels deep. I'm like, hey, Perry, you know, when you're evaluating a new, a new uh, type of CRM for your company, you know, who on your team uh, is responsible for that? Do you have a software team and a hardware team or do they all come together or, you know, who would that be? So I'm, gonna, I'm going to promote them that they have a team and let them say, you know, yeah, I'm on that team or, oh man, that's, that's three levels above my pay grade because I don't want to get caught in that. Cause when you get caught in that, sometimes it's going to happen, right? Either they lie or that's the, where the referral is. So, so you go in or maybe you reach at the top and the executive assistant says, you know what? Nobody talks to Perry. You got to go see Jack first. Then if Jack likes it, then they'll kick it up to Perry. So then you got to weigh the odds, right? So, okay, I'm going to go see Jack. So now I go see Jack and Jack says, oh yeah, Perry's got to sign off on that. So, you know what? I understand. I was talking to, to Perry's assistant and they said, you know, start with you and then you bump it up. But let me ask you something. What will your recommendation be to Perry based on our meeting just now? So I, I got to close for something. I got to know what that person thinks. So I'm not chasing my tail later. You know, oh yeah, uh, Perry's been really busy. I'm trying to get in with them, and and then you're you're dead. A lot of times, the inability to get to the real decision maker is that there's no bleeding neck. Sure. Right. So, yes. like, if this company's really feeling pain about this, and you have a solution to that pain, that that three hundred thousand dollar a year guy will take your phone call. He'll talk to you for five minutes or ten minutes or thirty minutes. It's worth his time. Yep. But if there's no bleeding neck, so again, it comes out like, do you guys actually really have a problem here? Right. All right. So that's that's number four. Number five is does it fit into their overall plans? It's like, well, you know, I would your lawn service is really awesome, but I'm moving to San Diego two months from now. So like there really isn't any point in hiring a new lawn service, right? So, so anyway, that, that's the five power disqualifiers. And what you will find is that, is that one to 5% of the people that you can talk to um, actually will fit the disqualifiers and you don't need to do anywhere near as many presentations and much conjoling. And, and if a person is properly qualified, they have the money, they have the bleeding neck, they are the decision maker, they do buy into USP that fits in their over our plans. You will usually find that it's not actually that difficult to sell them. Um, and, and so, uh, I mean, I, 
I pounded the phone and I drove all over Chicago land when I was a brand new rep. And really, I, I had a massive problem just confusing activity with productivity. I was incredibly busy, incredibly active. Is like, in fact, there was like this little program in the back of my head. It's like, you know what, Perry? As long as you're working really, really hard, you're not <laughs> a bad guy. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the insecurity. Um, so anyway, you know, that, th- that was just, uh, that was just a real trial by fire. Now, um, part of the problem was the company I sold for a lot of the products they sold, they didn't have that much of a USP and furthermore, they didn't really want to support what I sold. Okay. And like whether you're an employee or an entrepreneur or any way that you're whatever selling situation you're in, I I think one of the most important things is that whatever you're selling, that you have some firepower behind you to back you up. So you design something in or you sell a program that that somebody's not going to let you have egg on on your face. So so like um, one time. I was, I was so excited. I was selling circuit boards and there was this company um, that they needed to switch all their circuit boards from one kind of technology to another and they needed somebody to do it. And I showed up at the right person, uh, right time. And I, and so I took my client up to Wisconsin to see the company that was going to do all this work for him and everything looked fantastic. But the week before part of that company had been sold to another company and now it was on the other side of this door and you could not open the door because those people were employed by those other guys and it included the engineering department that was going to make sure all the designs were right. And so this company had brought in this freelance designer to kind of help in the old guy's place. Well, the buyer figured out really quick that this is just a freelance hired gun that they brought in and that the real engineering department had just been sold to somebody else. And as soon as they figured out that out, they were just mad. And they had driven all the way up from, from Chicago up to Milwaukee to have this meeting and look at the, and then all of a sudden they find out like, no, like they don't even actually employ this person. And of course, this is the most critical part of the deal because they needed somebody to absolutely guarantee this whole thing was going to work. And so they're all backpedaling and then the meeting's over and like the client wouldn't even return my phone calls anymore. And this was like the story of my life. Like everything I worked on was kind of like this. Okay. And, um, you know, sometimes dude, man, you're just selling the wrong product or you're selling it to the wrong people or you're selling it for the wrong people or you're selling it in the wrong situation like a lot of times, dude, it doesn't have anything to do with you. Like you're doing your job. You're doing everything you're supposed to do. Uh, you know, even a blind squirrel can find an acorn once in a while. But then if the blind squirrel finds the acorn, like we better have somewhere to put that thing, right? And so, and so I switched to this other company and it was a smaller company um, and they had less resources, but they were much more focused. They were like, we do this and we do it all the way and we make sure the job gets done. And they supported me and all of a sudden my job got like way easier. And all of a sudden I'm selling stuff. It's like, I can't tell you how therapeutic it was to like actually get a commission check. <laughs> like, oh my word. Like, and I mean, we were getting to the point of desperation so, so between commission check and like not making cold calls anymore because we had good lead generation in place where people would come to our website. They were like, yeah, I'm trying to solve this problem, trying to solve that problem. We had really good problem solving data and, and things, uh, tools for people to figure out their situations. Um, and, and so they would fill out these forms like, yeah, well, I want to know more about this. And then all of a sudden I'm, having these very polite email exchanges with different customers or, you know, they're calling in or I'm talking on the phone. They actually want to talk to me. Why? Because they have the money. They have a bleeding neck. They, my, 
my USP fits what they're looking for, they can actually say yes. Um, and it, oh, it's so much better. Oh my word. Like just, um, so I, I have a lot of sympathy for the sales guy out there. who's just beating his brains out <laughs> trying to, you know, so how, how can they, how can they apply that? How can, you know, the corporate America sales rep out there that has that list of 206 people, what, what can they do, you know, without irritating the boss, you know, or making them think they're taking a shortcut or not doing their job when in reality, they're going to be doing their job better. I mean, is there anything they can do to kind of take the initiative on their own? Well, the reason I wrote 80, 20 sales and marketing was because this was the book I really wished that I had had when I was new. And I didn't understand all of the ingredients of the sales process and how it actually works. And it's like, there's some parts of it that are like an engineering problem and they're very logical and they're very structural. And there's other parts that are like freakazoid human, you know, psycho terror movie, bizarre weirdness. Right. And you kind of have to be able to work with, with both. And, um, so I, I, I'll tell you a, a, a story that kind of illustrates all of it is I, I mentioned John who dropped out of high school when he was 17. So he moved, he hitchhikes to Vegas and he starts playing poker for a living. Uh, and now, by the way, his mother was like praying the rosary every morning at mass at 6 a.m., just scared to death that John's going to get himself into some trouble. And quite honestly, he's kind of lucky that he got out of that alive. Uh, so she lit a lot of candles for that boy. Um, but, he, you know, he's living by his wits in Vegas. And after a few weeks of these, he's like, man, this is harder than I thought it was going to be. So he goes to this gambling book bookstore. They just had all these gambling books. And he's in there prowling around. And he meets this other guy. And the other guy's name is Rob. Rob runs a professional gambling ring. So, hey, um, do you think you could teach me how to do what you do? Uh, for a percentage of the winnings, I could teach you how to do what we do. Uh, so they shake on it. And then Rob goes, jump in the Jeep, John. We're going for a ride. So they're driving down the highway, and John goes, all right, how do I win more poker games? And Rob goes, the way you win more poker games is you play with people who are going to lose, and those people are called marks. You don't play with professional poker players. You play with marks. And he says, so where do I find marks? And he goes, here, I'll show you. And he pulls into a parking lot, and they walk into a strip club, and there's girls and dancing and rock and roll and people drinking and carousing and biker guys and everything. And they sit down at this table and Rob pulls a sawed off shotgun out of his jacket and he holds it under the table and he opens it up and then he snaps it shut. So it goes, it's called racking the shotgun. And uh, so he racks the shotgun and these people look around like, hey, what was that? And the owner comes over. He's like, hey, what's going on over here? And he goes, teaching the lad a lesson. Don't worry about us. We're just fine. Not going to cause any trouble here. Won't do that again. He says to John, John, did you see those guys over there who turned around when they heard that noise? And John's like, yeah, they were like reaching for the pistols in their boots. And he's like, don't play poker with them. They're not marks. Play <laughs> poker with everybody else. And that was John's first lesson in 80-20. That is 80-20. 80-20 is rack the shotgun. Every single one of those five power disqualifiers is a rack the shotgun. Um some people search for what you sell on the internet. Some people don't. That's rack the shotgun. Some people click on your ad. Some people don't. That's rack the shotgun. Some people reply to your email. Some don't. That's rack the shotgun. Some people take the upsell 
uh, and some people don't rack the shot. It's all rack the shotgun. And so shotguns are getting racked everywhere. You could rack it yourself. You could watch other people rack it. The point is, is can you observe who responds? So like, for example, one of the most basic things that I didn't understand when I was a brand new sales rep was mailing lists. You can go rent mailing lists. You can get names of people who subscribe to this magazine or that magazine who bought this or that. And of course, there's all of these tools like Google AdWords and Facebook advertising where you can put, put um, like a quiz, like a disqualifier quiz, for example, in front of people. And you can spend you know, two or three bucks a click on Facebook and you can put it in front of those people and you can find out like, well, do these people qualify or do they not? You can lead them through a whole sales sequence and maybe it's Skype session, maybe it's a webinar, maybe it's a video, whatever it is, but you know, they're going to be pre-qualified. They're going to fill out a form um, and, and tell you, or maybe you get them on the phone and you ask them a few quick questions before you go any further, before you even begin to shift in sales mode and you find out, okay, do you have actually have a, a bleeding neck? And, um, you know, when, when I, when you move from the wrong side of 80, 20 to the right side of 80, 20, your life gets about 16 times easier because mathematically the difference is literally it's about 16 X. It's a big difference. Right. So th- that individual sales rep, I mean, can they, would you recommend they just come up with their own disqualifiers? I mean, how, how can, you know, a quota carrying sales rep, you know, in a cubicle, Maybe they can set their own appointments, go out into a territory. How do they disqualify those 206 people and not come across as arrogant or pushy or know-it-all? Well, well, you don't have to be arrogant or off-putting in order to – see, this isn't really about arrogance. This is, this is about truly finding out – do you actually have a problem and can I actually solve it? And is there any sense in us doing anything together? Because, you know, it doesn't do anybody any good for us to waste anybody's time, right? Every person who's ever gotten a telemarketing call uh, during dinner knows that we don't want to talk to salespeople that are solving problems that we don't have, right? We all know that, right? And, and, and so, you know, you can be very honest and you can say, um, my time is very limited. Um, you know, the hours in my day are very limited. Um, there's only so much traveling that I can get in this week. And I really, I, I don't want to make the trip if this isn't really going to help everybody involved. You can be completely sincere with that. Um, and, um, you know, Ari Galper, my longtime friend and colleague, he says, get to the truth, not the sale. Just find out what is the truth of the situation. And in the long run, that is a such better strategy. And if people know that you're trying to get to the truth, not the sale, they'll tell you the truth and they'll cooperate with you so much better. Right. And I think being a desperate salesperson, uh, you know, just trying to get more appointments or whatever, it it really is a disservice to everyone. Right. Um, oh, oh, one other thing. When you start bringing big slabs of mastodon meat and throwing them on the table because you are selling well, your company will give you a wide berth. Right. (laughs) You know, John broke every rule that these companies had, but he usually broke the records. And so he could get away. And, you know, I had the same experience. When when I was um when I was working in this the next job that actually was working, um 
I was only like 28, 29, okay? I was really wet behind the ears. Nobody really assumed that Perry knew all that much, but my marketing was actually very effective. I demonstrated over and over. I was good at getting leads. I was good at cultivating relationships with the customers. I understood the products. I would come up with these cheat sheets and these different kinds of things that you and I were talking about earlier um, to help qualify the customers. Um, let me let me tell you a funny story. I I was um, and and let's keep in mind, you know. I got that first sales job. I got fired from that job. I had, after two years, I had really nothing particularly impressive to show for it. It's kind of like, you know, how do you dress up a resume as, as, as cleverly as you can without actually lying to anybody kind of like cat puffing up their fur. I mean, this is where I was at. Right. Uh, And I, I really very unsuccessful, then I, I, I discover direct marketing. I get fired from this job. I get a different job. It's much more simpatico, like we were saying. So here I go to Massachusetts to help my Massachusetts rep in, in Boston. And we go and we go to these different companies and we visit this one company in Connecticut. Now, what we were selling, we were selling these circuit boards that made your product network compatible. And basically, you could just write us a check for $200, you get the circuit board. And if you modified your product a little bit, you could just plug it in. It was like instant networking. And it, it, it solved a bleeding neck for certain kinds of companies. Now, our $200 boards, people thought they were kind of expensive because they knew the parts on that board probably only cost $35. And so I'm, I'm sitting in this customer and I'm showing them our product and you know, we sell these interchangeable boards and this is really convenient. And the guy looks at me and he goes, dude, I could, I, I know all the parts on that board. I could build that board for $35. And I said, now what most sales guys would do, would they, they would start to get a little bit insecure and they would like tell you, but okay, but you don't understand our product is like really, really, really extra good and all this kind of stuff. I, I went this totally other path. I said, Absolutely, you could build that. And in fact, I pulled out a white paper and I, I slapped it on his desk. I said, I actually have a white paper that tells you what you need to do if you want to build that. And you could build that and it would cost you $35 and you'd save 165 on every unit. Okay, and now, like, and the guy's like, he says, why are you going to give me the secret recipe? Right. And I go, here's why. Because here's what's going to happen. Networking stuff is pretty difficult. So you're going to have to pull your smartest software engineer in order to work on this. Okay? And he's not going to be working on your main thing anymore, your USP. He's going to be working on networking, which is just this accessory thing that you happen to need, okay? And so it's going to take you about three months to get to a prototype, okay? This is going to get you about two more months to where you're actually ready to send in the board and submit it for certification, okay? And then it's going to get rejected a couple of times, and then two more months are going to go by, and then it's going to finally pass certification. And now eight months have gone by, and then... Uh, the next customer, they're going to order the device net network instead of the Profibus network. And it turns out you developed the wrong network and you have to start all over again. I said, that's, and, and now you're, you lost eight months having your best engineer working on like the wrong project because none of your other stuff is, is moving forward. I said, now on the other hand, take you about two or three weeks. You could design a connector in your existing board you could buy our boards for 200 bucks and it's designed in. And then if you get some huge order, then you can put your engineer on it and then you can make it in house if you really need to, or we can come up with some kind of volume discount for you or something. But like, you really don't want to do this like yourself. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, we've helped hundreds of companies get over this. So I get in the car and Paul says to me, Perry, that was the best sales presentation I have ever seen. Now, 
I didn't walk in there going, man, I'm going to wow these people with my sales presentation. I was just doing disqualification, right? I was just saying, yes, you can build this yourself. And here, here's a list of all the parts. And here's, here's the place where you go buy pieces of software that help you do it. And, you know, and, and, and here's where you send it to go get certified and all this other stuff. But dude, like you don't want to do that. We're in that business and it's harder than you think. And it was, I mean, it was, and, and when, when you come from a place of complete truth and authenticity and they can tell that your feet are absolutely planted on concrete, when you make a statement and there's nothing squishy about anything you're saying, you have so much posture and so much credibility. And, and I guess I would say if you don't feel like you're in a position where you have your feet on that concrete and that they could push on you and you could just push right back, you're selling the wrong thing. Or you don't understand how to sell it. Or you're not trying to disqualify the customer properly. I was just disqualifying. Hey, man, you really have the budget. You know, how much do these engineers cost anyway? And how much does it cost for you to be late on all this other stuff? Oh, yeah, this is going to make you late delivering something. How much does that cost, right? Right. And and so, and, and boy, there's a certain amount of respect that people have when a sales guy sees the whole entire situation. And he is multilingual. So he is a little conversant with finance and a little bit conversant with purchasing and a little bit conversant with sales and marketing and manufacturing and engineering or, or whatever to where the sales guy is actually going to try to help you figure out. So how, how are you going to sell more of your green widgets? I want to help you sell more of your green widgets. Um, just however I can do it. And if, but I'm only going to do it if you meet the five power disqualifiers. Then I become your business partner. But if you can't write a check, I, you know, I can't help you with your green widgets. Sorry. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's shift gears a little bit. You, uh, you became a, a master of Google AdWords, and then you were an early adopter of Facebook advertising. Yep. Right. Uh, so as we record this in late uh, 2017, uh, should people still be focusing on Facebook or are you seeing um, the next iteration, you know, from Google AdWords to Facebook advertising? Is there something else that's piquing your interest? Um, so, so Google and Facebook are like yin and yang or rock, paper, scissors or something. You know, they're really very different animals and each has its place. You know, we have a quiz is FB for me.com and is a W for me.com and you can score yourself on both of those platforms. I'll, I'll just give you some observations. So um, either platform, you don't just stick a pencil behind your ear and dive in. You really need to know what you are doing or you will get slaughtered. Okay. That's just all there is to it. Like if you're not willing to get educated about it, forget it. And by the way, most of the agencies that you might hire um, are not competent. Like most of the guys walking up and down the street selling Google AdWords, selling Facebook ads, they do not know what they are doing. Um, and it's, it's really hard to successfully outsource those things. Now, uh, so like don't even bother unless you're willing to get educated. Um, Facebook advertising is, there's it's kind of an interesting thing going on with it is it's very competitive, but Facebook is also very aggressive in building out new capabilities within their platform so that they can exploit more and more and more opportunities that exist in the marketplace. The, the level of sophistication, the AI behind it, the, the deep learning, it just keeps improving. And so Facebook, you know, a lot of us have started to hear, you know, these little rumors that Facebook is better at figuring out that somebody is manic depressive than like a psychologist or something, uh, which might be true. You know, um, it's kind of like that old story where, uh, the database people at Target figured out a girl was pregnant before her father did, right? Right. We that story. I that story. <laughs> right? So that, like this is how smart the machines are becoming. Um, and so you need to, you need to get, get, 
r- really good at that and, and know how to use those platforms. And of course, well, if, if you go take our quizzes, is fbforme.com or is awforme.com, you can sign up with your email address and you can get more resources. Um, but w- what I would say is that, so there's like the mechanics of AdWords and Facebook and everything, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to one thing is, is do you have a killer offer in product and sales funnel or not? Okay. Um, and is it unique? Does it really have a killer unique selling proposition? Because, you know, the mechanics of Facebook and AdWords are all kind of color by numbers. Like you just go through these procedures and, you know, maybe 10 or 15% of the agencies out there actually know how to do the color by numbers. (laughs) Okay. And 80% of them really don't. Okay. But that the color by numbers only gets you so far. Okay. What it really comes down to is how good are you at telling your story and how truly unique and distinctive is your product really? Um, and so I think the real, for, for an entrepreneur at least, the real art is like a, tweaking and adjusting the features and nature of that product until it really like nails uh, the marketplace um, and, and does something that no, nobody else can do, guarantees something that nobody else can guarantee. Your unique selling proposition is really what do you uniquely guarantee? Um, and, uh, and by the way, you know, as a salesperson, can you figure out a way to guarantee what you sell? Now, an interesting thing will happen if you do. If you have to guarantee what you sell, you will screen who buys it from you. Um, and so, so I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, my friend, Tom Hubiar, um, he was a CEO of a SEPCO and Tom made this in, so they sold pharmaceutical tank valves. So this was a $4,000 valve that goes into a big piece of pharmaceutical equipment that makes bioactive chemicals that are eventually going to be injected in somebody's veins. So it can't have any contamination whatsoever. This is like the most conservative industry on earth. And, um, and Tom and and they, Tom had this huge competitor. It was a hundred million dollar company. He's this little tiny, like $5 million company. He came up with this guarantee and the guarantee was, if our valve fails for any reason, if we shipped the wrong valve to you, if it's contaminated, if like long list of stuff, any of these problems, we will pay for you to buy our competitor's valve and for a union welder to cut our valve out of the bottom of your tank and replace it with the competitor's valve, which was a procedure that cost about $40,000 on a $4,000 valve. Okay. So he's incurring 10 times the cost of his product. If anything goes wrong. Well, if you're going to make a 10 X guarantee that could bankrupt your company, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to make sure that all of your processes and procedures are ad- absolutely ship shape, and you're going to make sure that nobody buys your thing unless they really should be installing your thing in the right place. And so they, he had to put a lot of processes in place in his company to make this happen, but then he did it. And what he told me was he had to make good on that guarantee about four times a year, which cost him $160,000. But that guarantee got him in some, I, I forget how long, but in some period of years, he got to 90% market share in that market for making an absolutely balls-to-the-wall guarantee in a business where most people wouldn't have any guarantee at all. And businesses, business-to-business marketing and selling usually does not have guarantees. 
you know, you could, you could have milestones. You could have things like, okay, so, so we're going to install our CRM system. And if, if the XYZ part is not up and running by October 15, we will actually refund $10,000 to you. And if the ABC part is not up and running by November 15, we'll refund $5,000 to you. And they know you have skin in the game. And so I totally believe in skin in the game on both sides. And, 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 if, and if, if you're not willing to guarantee it, why should they be willing to buy it? Right. Sure. So on the, on the technology front, though, are you, should people still be focusing on Facebook? Uh, it, is it played out? Or is it uh, it's not up? played out. It's, it's, still, it's still alive and active. I'm doing all kinds of stuff on Facebook. Now, I think, you know, maybe three years from now, maybe it will be a little bit saturated. And it's certainly very competitive. And the competition is thick now. But it's not played out. There, here's what's true about both Google Display Network in particular and Facebook. Is there are so, there's all these little nooks and crannies inside the advertising system, like there's all these different ways that you can configure campaigns and ways of targeting people. And each of these has its own sort of rock, paper, scissors relationship with whatever everybody else is doing. So if you have a deeper knowledge of Facebook ads, like we have this thing called Facebook University that we make available to our Renaissance Club members, which is 99 bucks a month, where we give you a state-of-the-art training. And, and so there's all these different angles. It's like, well, you know, if you were, you know, if, if you were in the military and you were going in some strange building, well, you might have sonar and you might have like night vision goggles and you might have like, it might be, you know, sort of, sort of like 24 where, you know, the computers have all these diagrams of stuff. Like there could be all these different ways to make your way through this, you know, some building, right? And if you're using a different kind of vision than your opponent, then you can see things your opponent can't see. And that's really how the Google and Facebook interfaces work. Um, and so um, now, now Google, like if you're a national advertiser, you're on search, man, you're in for a brutal battle, okay? If you're a local advertiser, it's not, you got more wiggle room. If you're on the display network, there's more middle room. Um, if you're in Google Shopping, there's more wiggle room. All these platforms have space where people aren't really playing very competently, but you have to dig harder than you used to be able to find it. Right. Very cool, man. Well, this has been awesome. Where should we send people to learn more about you? Uh, I'm going to link to your two uh, quizzes that you mentioned about uh, AdWords and Facebook. Uh, but is it perrymarshall.com? Yeah, so, Do you have? Um, yeah, you should go to perrymarshall.com, and we have uh, you can you we sell the ultimate guide to Facebook advertising and the ultimate guide to Google AdWords. We also sell probably the best deal is eighty twenty sales and marketing. We, um, on Amazon, it's about 17 bucks. We, we include some additional bonuses and sell it to you for $7, including shipping in the United States, um, in order to engage with you more closely. And, uh, so yeah, like we literally are taping dollar bills to these books to get them out to people, <laughs> but we find that this, this brings us good customers. And we, in fact, I was just looking at our numbers on this. And if, if you do that, if you go to perrymarshall.com slash 8020, you can buy the book for seven bucks and you will watch the choreography of how we sell. And you can learn a lot about sales by watching how we sell our 8020 book and what we right. talk about and how we disqualify. In fact, your whole entire experience of what happens in the next few months will be entirely determined by what you click on. What you don't click on, we have kind of have this automated machine that self-adjusts to what you're interested in, and you'll find it quite fascinating. You can, you should take notes on what happens to you next. Yeah, and I'd recommend it. I mean, success leaves clues, right? I mean, I've got your eighty twenty book, and I think too many entrepreneurs think they have to reinvent every single little thing so they can truly own it. You know, whereas, like I said, I I took the exact structure right none of the words but the structure 
and built my own based on what you had made in a totally different industry. So yes. that's, that's not only, it's not only ethical as entrepreneurs, it's like, it's recommended, right? I mean, it's, that's right. Because I only did that because I respected you. And for all these years, I mean, you probably, you didn't know, but I'm saying, I got this from Perry Marshall. Go look at, go, go study Perry Marshall. He, you know, if you're an engineer, a technical background, go see what Perry's doing. You know, you want yeah. Google AdWords, go get his book. So it's, you know, buy the book for seven bucks, see how he markets to you and see what pieces and parts you can pull from there and apply to your own business. So a lot of people learn by watching how we sell. And, and, and I like that, you know, we're congruent. Like we eat our own dog food. Right. All right, man. Well, this has been fantastic. Thanks for, uh, for coming on the show. Uh, and I'll be sure we're going to have notes. We'll link to everything um, in the, um, in the show notes. But uh, it's just great catching up with you, Perry. Thanks for uh, coming on the sales podcast. Wes, thanks for having me on. It's an honor. It's a pleasure to hook up with you again here. And uh, hey, everybody, you know, if, you know, maybe you're like some guy driving on a dark night in Minnesota. And you're like, man, this thing is like harder than I, I thought it would be. Well, take hope because with a little visceral fortitude and a little creativity and a little shoe polish and a little duct tape and, you know, some sales mojo, you can, you can transcend. So fight the fight. Amen. Stay the course. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks for coming to the show. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. Did you write down those five? Are you following those five? Are you finding people with money? Are you finding people with a bleeding neck? Do you have them buy into your USP, your unique selling proposition? Probably not. If I had to bet money, I'm not a betting man, but I would bet on that. You know, I mentioned I spent some time with a friend of mine yesterday and his staff, a new owner of a bike shop here in Temecula. And I asked them what their USP is and they didn't know what I meant. And so they're not alone. Okay. You have to be clear on what makes you unique. When I say, why should I buy from you? And you tell me we have better service. You're dead in the water. Everybody says they have better service. Have you ever met a company that says, oh, buy from us. We have terrible service. The problem with, with service, right, selling on service, is that I don't know if you have good or bad service until after I already gave you my money. So it's just, it's not a differentiator. And, you know, if I can remove your name and put your competitor's name on top of that slogan or tagline or USP, then it's not unique. Because every single competitor is going to say, well, oh, we have great service. You know, one of the classic USPs is, is Domino's old one, you know, fresh hot pizza delivered in 30 minutes or less, or it's free. They didn't say they had the best recipes. They didn't say, you know, it's fresh ingredients from the old country, all organic, locally sourced. They, the company was started years ago at the edge of a college campus, and they knew who their customers were. They were stoned college kids. They were stoned, so they had the munchies. They were stoned, so they couldn't drive. So they delivered fresh, hot pizza quickly. So that was the deal, okay? And Pizza Hut, Little Caesars, Papa John's could not put that. You couldn't put their name over that tagline, okay? Because that was unique to Domino's. So what is your unique selling proposition? This is hard to figure out on your own. I know this is what I do for a living. It's been hard for me to figure out my own. That's why I go to conferences. Like I said, I'm leaving this afternoon for Phoenix. You know, I'll spend, I'll spend three and a half days in Scottsdale working on myself, growing, meeting with others, sharing ideas, helping each other grow. And so this is what I do for a living, helping people from the outside looking in. It's a lot easier to figure out. So, you know, my, my friend, my client here locally, that's their homework over the next couple of weeks. I'll be meeting with them several more times and, um, we're going to figure that out. And then they're going to bang that drum far and wide and loud. You know, people think they, you have to get the message to the right people. You just got to get the right message out. It'll find the right people. That's what too many people mess around with. Sure, you've got Facebook and whatnot with the algorithms, and you can show things to specific people, and that, that is a big help. But if you send a weak message to the right people, it's a fail. You're better off sending the right message to everyone and let it resonate. Let it bounce around. Let it get shared. It'll find the right people. But what is your message? 
do you need help with that? Hit me up. Uh, like I said, we can do this remotely. We can do this. You can come to me. You can spend more money and have me come to you. Um, or you can join the Make Every Sale course. Uh, it's a private group. We meet weekly. I answer your questions live on the calls. I answer your questions uh, in the private group, you know, uh, through messages and, and discussions. So, and that's the most affordable way to get help from me almost one-on-one. -on -one. Obviously, it's a group in that setting, but I'll answer your specific questions. So join us now, makeeverysale.com, or hit me up, thesaleswhisperer.com. Stop the presses, stop the presses, stop the presses. So I had to stop what I was doing because I got a call. I got a call back-to-back -back from the same number from a place in Florida uh, from a guy I was actually trying to reschedule to speak with earlier today since I'm traveling later today. And this individual has seen my content, uh, knows that I'm a speaker, knows that I'm an author, wants me to speak uh, to his group in Florida. So how about them apples? You need to be constantly putting yourself out there. Hopefully it's through original content. But you know, and I mentioned this before, you can make less content but make it better but then promote it, share it, make sure it's really getting out there so people find you. It is very nice to get calls and have people say, hey, I want to hire you. You know, I hope I can afford you, but I want you. And so from that point, you know, you can make something work. If, if it's a good human being, if they're not desperate, if they're not needy, if they're not pushy, I'll find a way to work with you somehow, right? Obviously, I can't give my services away, Um but I will be creative and help you. Um, if you find me like that, treat me with respect. You have realistic goals and, and you want to grow. So just thought I would share that very timely. Obviously, you wouldn't know from the recording uh, what's going on. I like to give you a little, a little look behind the curtain. Look under the hood how things get done. As I was saying, though, hit me up, thesaleswhisper.com. Go to the contact us. That will come to me. We'll schedule a time. We'll talk. And I will help you make Every sale. Now, go sell something. <laughs>